Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for not watching the Red Sox. Are they playing? Does it matter? No, it does not. Not this year. Um, we are very pleased to have Hugh Glover here. I have been here since 1999 at the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum. Bob Jolly, for our home audience, director of the Athenaeum. Um, Hugh's association with the Athenaeum precedes that by many, many years. And perhaps Hugh can mention how, how far back it goes. So he has worked on frames. In 2011, um, he surveyed 42 of the frames in this room of the, I think there are 82 in here, something like that, um, to give us a sense of what, what did they need uh, to remain in good shape, to improve their condition. Um, so we are really lucky to have had a partial survey done. We have written a grant to fund the rest of the survey, so all of the 87 frames, I think there are 100 objects here, mostly paintings, but we're going to get the entire uh, collection surveyed. Hugh is going to do that. Then we'll have a complete survey, which is the preliminary to go asking for money to then work on the frames. It's a long-term project. So um, uh, Hugh's association is long, and, and uh, it has been beneficial to the Athenaeum. By way of a formal introduction, Hugh Glover is conservator of furniture and wood objects at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center, where he has been working since 1988. He received diplomas in antique furniture restoration from West Dean College in 1979, and conservation and restoration of wood, stone, and polychrome from the City and Guilds of London Art School in 1985. His association with us is long. Please welcome Hugh Glover. I have, I have worked on um, uh, um, frames, frames from here. Uh, Sally Lawrence used to bring them down to Williamstown, where I am. And uh, chunks of missing stuff. We would uh, replace them. That's not very difficult. And um, loose bits, secure them. Um, I remember the, they, all, they all used to have a little squared number. Um, <laughs> which, uh, which would have referred to a, a catalog or a paper. And I must admit that it's, um, I was kind of hoping that I, I do have somewhere the, your old catalogs, but um, I can't identify, um, I'm not really art histor historian, I'm more frames, and I can't identify all the um, painters because they don't have these, they don't have a system. And I, I, it's, it's handy to have a system, I, I, I think, where, however it is achieved. Um, my short story is, this is a fantastic collection. Um, it is eight years ago or thereabouts that I, I did survey uh, 42 odd. And I work with a multitude of museums uh, on frames and um, museums are, the, the, this collection here is like 90% uh, original. Uh, it's a small time frame, but it's 90% original. And uh, museums don't have that kind of number. Uh, the museum, the big museum in the town where I live is called the Clark. And I'd say, I'd estimate that perhaps 3% of their frames are original. Three? Three. So uh, we have it just numerically, or if you were to take the Metropolitan Museum, um, where the numbers are huge, it, maybe it's 50% or something like that. So that's what's special here, is this very high number of original frames. And the non-original ones are quite noticeable quite quickly. <laughs> Um, anyway, so that's the, the that's the short story, and I, I think that really this this collection deserves to be um, put out there or published in some way. And now there are more ways of doing that. Um, they don't have to be fantastic photographs, but I do think that uh, it would be it would be useful for people to realize that the, the, because these are standards, these are how 
these artists are framed. And the, and the collection is largely American, uh, and that is where there is more interest, where there is less scholarship, but um, there is more interest in the American ones. So anyway, let's take a, a, a look at the world of uh, picture frames that surround the art. And I, it might have this effect on you that uh, you will um, look at them more afterwards um, and think about them. Or did, and you have framing issues at home too. We all, we all uh, face that. I'm, I'm gonna outline the development of the 19th century uh, American frame to put the frames in this collection into context. And I'll draw a larger, larger picture with examples from other collections and periods up until uh, 20th century. And I'll also touch on some of their maintenance and preparations for exhibitions. There is a large industry of uh, involving museums and exhibitions. Uh, frames have been neglected for the, but since in the last 25 years, they've been gaining interest. And uh, the most recent frame conference was uh, concluded this month in Sid Sydney, Australia. That is about four days of presentations, talks about uh, frames in museums in Australia. Uh, but there were visiting people from uh, all uh, the, the, the Americas and, uh, and Euro Europe. And uh, on American frames, there is not a lot written. There are some books, some chapters, some articles, some uh, sections in painting catalogs. But the big book, the, the one that I want to see, or the one that I would like to read, and that sort of thing, the big book ha hasn't been written. It would be expensive to, to write it because it's gonna need a lot of images. You can get so far by looking at the front of the frame, but it's the back that is also crucial. My background in the UK is woodworking, carving, gilding, and conservation, small detail stuff. And my interest in American frames came through the many frame paintings that passed through my workplace in Williamstown, where they are being conserved. Uh, it's a constant flow. I work with the frames for their maintenance and presentation, and I evaluate them with their paintings for their date and whether they are original or have been changed. For this, a good look at both sides, front and back, with the painting is, is most revealing. I judge frames on paintings hanging on the wall for the partnership, how the frame participates. Is it original or is it a good or bad alternative? And there are bad, there are terrible frames on paintings, and I don't mind saying it. Um, but they, they are still housing, so they still function. Uh, they. The interesting ones are the original pairings. This one is about 1890. Occasionally a painting has never been removed, like this one here. And the original nails are still in place, cut nails for most of the 19th century and later wire nails. More often, the painting has been removed and the new hardware was used to put it back, but still the original nail marks are present and aligned. I count the nail holes and, um, that to, to determine whether a frame is original to a painting. Other indicators include the shared oxidized and dirted surfaces on the backs, or reasonable explanations for any changes. Perhaps a stretcher has been changed out, the stretcher for the canvas. And there should be a match for the period style, materials, and techniques. Original pairings establish a chronology of frame styles and materials, and an understanding of how different artists were originally framed and we'll get into that a little bit more later on. A dated painting can indicate the date of its frame, and an, an original frame can date an unknown painting. So it becomes useful. This one here is, uh, the painting is by Thomas Rossiter, uh, 1841. So we're in a previous era to what we have in here. 
generally, let me just describe the frames. Uh, generally, they have four rails with shape profiles derived from classical architecture, essentially hollows, rounds, flats, and OG forms. And they, that's what these frames are composed of. These usually slope inwards toward the painting to draw the viewer in, and sometimes they slope outwards, called reverse profile, and push the painting forward. The top molding is the most forward part, and the main molding is commonly on the inside. A shapely top molding, like this one, is described as swept sides. Um, there probably there are some here. Otherwise, they're straight. The sight edge is next to the canvas. A rebate in the back holds the painting, and there is an outside profile against the wall. What is the frame doing, apart from being a protective container? It separates the painting from the surroundings and creates a visual emphasis that influences our perception of the painting. It is a series of shapes and patterns around the subject with lights and darks that shift with different light angles, noticeable as you walk past a bright fluted cove, of which there are examples here. Corner ornaments create diagonals across the canvas, adding emphasis. Center ornaments make vertical and horizontal suggestions, and a plain flat at the sight edge is a breathing space before the art. Frames with concentric layers increase the recessional perspective within the painting, and flatter profiles work on two-dimensional works. The texture of ornament and the color of finishes can enhance the texture and colors of a painting, and gold reflects light onto the canvas. Italy was an early influence on the design and development of frames, and 18th century France excelled in their carving, gilding, and design. England's less ornate frame style came here, first as fancy imports, and then as new American carvers developed regional styles. Uh, these are two Boston-made original carved Rococo examples on Copley portraits. Uh, one, one is the MFA Boston, the other one's in Yale. She's in Yale, he's in Boston. Um, American frame styles evolved fashionably to meet the needs of paintings and interiors, and national characteristics developed from the many foreign influences. Frame making transitions during the 19th century from small shops with hand tools to large shops with steam powered machines. Wood is abundant here, and up to 1900, clear white pine was common for frames. Then fine-grained fine hardwoods were also used, about 1900, like poplar. Imported figured mahogany veneer was popular, about 1830 to 40, and varnished walnut used around 1880, of which we have lots here, and right behind me. Chestnut and oak began to be used around 1880 for the decorative effect when the wood grain was oil gilded directly. Uh, Aikens from Philadelphia, he would often use oil gilded oak or chestnut. Wormy chestnut was popular around 1920, 1960 because of the blight that decimated the tree. In contrast, the common English wood was knotty red pine, often glued up from thinner pieces as their wood was already scarce long before uh, this period. White oak was popular in France and poplar was common in Italy. I brought some models here that show new and aged gilding the goal for gilding is about 23 carats and does not tarnish. Each leaf measures three and three eighths of an inch square, and today one leaf costs about $2. The goal was alloyed with copper to make it redder and with silver to make it paler, and various shades have been favored at different periods and by some artists. The 19th century gilded finish was bright. 
a bright, rich glow of gold that is not distressed or toned. There is no coating on the gold, not varnished or anything. Although now it can be altered with grime and soot from lamps and furnaces and also overpaint. For centuries, there have been two gilding methods, oil, water gilding and oil gilding. To water gild, the surface is coated with gesso, a mix of chalk and animal glue, to provide a consistent base. A colored clay mixed in glue, called bowl, is applied, and a complementary undercolor is applied as a complementary undercolor and a burnishable surface. The gold is applied to a puddle of water and the leaf settles as the water soaks into the gesso, where it is attached only by the activated glue from the gesso and bowl. This is water gilding. On drying, the gold can be burnished with a polished stone to give greater contrast and depth to the design. The color of the bowl varied. Red-brown plum colors were used in the early century. Black gray was used for highlights after about 1830, and red-brown became redder as the century progressed. Various yellow shades were used as background colors. Oil gilding is a quicker process. A slow-drying oil varnish is brushed on, and when almost dry, the gold is applied, and it sticks to the tacky surface. You can oil gild a, a coin. It doesn't need preparation layers. Or if you have a, a, a dome on your exterior building, uh, the, the exterior dome, that is obviously uh, oil gilding. Each method has a different appearance, aging characteristics, and solubility. Oil gilding cannot be burnished, and water gilding can. Overlapping gold leaves occur with water gilding, not with oil gilding. Water gilding will wash quickly off with water, and oil gilding can withstand some water. Even on a dome, like a state capital or that sort of thing, um, the gold has no varnish on it. Gold is enduring. Um, it does last very well. Water gilding alone was used in the US until about 1815, 20, and then oil gilding was used for the new molded compo ornament. Silver leaf was popular during the 1840s and 80s. It is a fraction of the cost of gold, but required a varnish to protect the surface from oxidizing, and the varnish was dyed yellow to resemble gold, reviving an old technique. This is an 1815 example of a common federal frame with a narrow, single narrow rail shaped with molding planes and small shops. There could be narrow bands of carved ornament and a cove as the main profile. The surfaces were water gilded and often burnished. And the outside profile, usually a flat or shallow hollow, was painted with yellow earth pigments. The Sully style frame occurs around 1825-35 with a wider rail, a bevel main molding, and all water gilding. The rail begins to be made of two nested sections to increase the width. Here we have three and four nested sections on these frames. And these two were shaped with hand planes. The profile becomes shapelier in the 30s and 40s with deep coves on the inside and outside and a developing back edge molding. There is still no uh, ornament, well, at least in this one. Simple molding machines were introduced in the 1840s, that's at the top left, and developed quickly and by the 80s, they were steam powered and provided the moldings we associate with interiors like this one. And today's digital machines are better still. Molded compo or composition 
begins to be used for ornament on American frames around 1810-15, and they quickly replace carved wood. I have some examples here. It is Fresh compo is a stiff dough-like mixture of resin, oil, glue, and powdered chalk. The warm dough was pressed in reverse molds of various designs and glued to the gesso rails, and then gilded. It's flexible when it's applied and can be conformed to the shape of a rail. Other materials were also used, like leather, but compo was by far, by far the most popular. Compo is easy to make for oneself, and ornaments are commercially available today. Compo and carved wood have different characteristics. Compo ornament has no undercutting because it comes from a rigid mold, whereas carved wood can be undercut to increase the shadowing. Compo develops shrinkage cracks on drying, but it is incredibly durable and perhaps more so than gilded carved wood. Compo does not require gesso preparation layer and it could be oil gilded directly. To increase the impact of the design, the forward parts were often water gilded and burnished after applying a layer of bold to the compo. So compo is mostly oil gilded without gesso and it has burnished highlights where colored bold was applied. Gives it more bling. This frame is 1825. You see the use of uh, developing a chronology. Um, I can't remember, this canvas is dated somewhere, um, and I know it's the original frame, so I can say this frame is 1825. That's kind of specific, it's useful, it's good. Uh, well, from my point of view it is. Early compo was placed at the frame's corners, and by the 30s it was spreading along the rails. The outside profile develops, develops a projecting, projecting back edge molding, and the outside was now gilded instead of painted. Foliate and organic forms were more popular in the first half of the century, and progressively they became more formal, like the ones here. Common top moldings went from a natural looking noded stick during 1840-55 to reed bundles and then laurel and berry, of which there are many examples here. Fashionable surface treatments were used to increase the gilder's vocabulary. Open weave net, tool net, one could call it, here it is exposed at the top of this slide, was used around 1830 to 50, where the net was glued to the gesso and oil gilded for a texture that mimicked 18th century incised work, but at a fraction of the cost. Uh, this frame has a flaking condition, um, and it would be, I would, in fact, next week, I have to put on an optivizer and secure all these little flakes down. Um, that's what, <laughs> to try and save it, basically. It's a, an original frame for the painting. Um, Sand has traditionally been used by gilders for texture, where a sand layer is glued to the gesso and oil gilded for a grainy matte finish, showing as darker due, due to the extra shadow. Stencil dot patterns, as on the left here, were popular during the 40s and 60s and persisted during the 70s and 80s. There are examples here. And more formal designs, like on the right, were used after 1860. Other sand and grit patterns were used in different periods, and some I most admire are from the 1890s. Incised gesso is another old technique revived in the 1870s, many examples here, and used on flat friezes, of which there are, there are examples here. A pattern was lightly cut in the gesso, water gilded, and then picked out with selective burnishing. And some of these here were picked out further with uh, pen and ink work, black, uh, 
black, black uh, designs. This is high-end quality work at a time when gilding and frame making could be at the highest standard with meticulous detailing and abundant gold. By the 1850s, frames were beginning to have three nested sections with a deep outer section, flatter midsection, and a flat liner at the site edge. This 1890s frame has four nested sections for even more depth and width. There are common themes to, to the decoration of all these frames. Bands of differently patterned compo are separated by unadorned moldings. The compo is oil gilded and highlighted with burnished tops, while the plain moldings in between are water gilded with alternate matte and burnished finishes. The common sight edge is a flat liner finished with matte water gilding, as burnishing next to the painting would be a distraction. There were developments in the later 19th century in response to greater numbers in developing technology. Plaster ornament began to be used around 1880, cast from now flexible gelatin molds that could, could accommodate undercutting within the design. Plaster was used for larger top moldings, as it is inherently weaker than compo. Brass leaf gildings occurs after 1880. I don't think there's any, any here. Initially used as for secondary surfaces, like an outside cove, and then cheaper frames were gilded entirely with brass. Brass leaf requires a varnish coating, or it would oxidize, and the cost of brass is negligible. Here are two more frame terms, closed corner and open corner. Closed corner is the earlier, earlier method that I have been showing till now, where all the decoration is applied after the frame has been assembled as a rectangle. Open corners, with two examples here, begin around 1885 as a faster prefabricated method where the decoration is applied to long rail lengths ahead of being cut to length and glued and glued up. The later open corner method is noticeable when the ornament is not continuous around the corners like these. Most frame shops today supply open corner frames as the rails have been pre-decorated. Shadow boxes were fitted to some frames in the, in the 80s and 90s, and this one is from 1902. They protected the then jewel-like gilding, and there are several examples in this gallery, eight or nine, I think. And they have protected the gilding from grime and enable us to see something of the original brightness. This is uh, Daniel Chester French on the left is the artist and Rockwell Kent on the right, 1907. Moving now into the 20th century, these paintings are, um, right, uh, many artists had already been reacting to the opulent mainstream frame styles and preferred more nuanced ornament and gilding. And so we see muted effects as it shifts from the Gilded Age to the craftsman's aesthetic. We also begin to see reproduction finishes intended to look older. The arts and crafts style was popular with simpler, less bright, carefully colored surfaces and compo was, placed, was replaced with shallow carved wood shown here. There were many small shops and individual makers of, of artisanal frames often for specific paintings. And these are the most written about category of American frames. They kind of correspond to the American Impressionist. Larger frame shops developed. The Newcomb Macklin Company of Chicago produced frames in many styles, promoted by catalogs and salesmen, and used by many artists. On the left is a 1946 example, 
The middle shows the distinctive corner construction with a piece of plywood helping the strengthen the corner. And on the right is one of their simplified Stanford White designs. The framing company House of Heidenrich came to New York City from Holland in 1936, initially making reproduction frames and then custom frames for contemporary modernist artists, including Marsden Hartley. Here we see the rustic look they popularized of the wormy chestnut that was available. Perhaps it was Heidenreich, uh, Heidenreich uh, still exists in New York City. They still make frames. Perhaps it was Heidenreich who introduced the linen liner in the 1940s. In the 50s and 60s, they were often used as inserts in old frames that were too large, as in the left picture. I think these are both Renoirs. And by the 1960s, they have become a fashionable inclusion in re reproduction frames, like uh, the beer stat out in the further um, out there. The older French frame on the left had been heavily altered for the painting. Cut and pasted is how I describe it, basically. There's a cut here, here, each side of each symmetrical cut, cutting right through the rail. And then you remove a section, and then you join it up again. You're removing a few inches, and uh, you strengthen it with, uh, with wood on the back, because you've basically um, made it quite weak. And then they're uh, incorporated. So it is a, this is a um, 18th century French frame, but it has been cut and pasted, cut, reduced, cut down uh, to fit the painting, um, which happened a lot, and I'll mention again. And he, here we were evaluating the frame to see if we could uh, clean the gilding, and that was not possible because it is, uh, at the time of modifying the frame, uh, they regilded it, and uh, there's not a lot of gold here, and they hid that fact by making it dark. But the, uh, this is destined for fancy exhibition, and um, they wanted it to look night bright brighter, like the other frames in the exhibition, but it's not possible. But we are, here we are experimenting with changing the textile on the liner. And that's what we did do. We made it a little bit brighter by changing out the textile on the liner. It's a modern liner, it's not old. Needless to say, there are now curators who are quite despairing of certain linen liners in their collections. And what happens is, um, if you're in this uh, museum business, your painting goes, gets borrowed and hangs next to others that have been borrowed and suddenly you see your painting in new light. But it's not really the painting I'm talking about, of course, I'm talking about the frame. Uh, you, you see the frame in new light and suddenly you realize your frame is great or it's terrible or it's okay. It stands up to the rest or it's a disappointment. That's what happens. <laughs> I can't remember uh, the name of this artist. Um, this is a mid 20th century reproduction frame. The development of synthetic materials in the 20th century provided more low cost methods for casting whole rails with ornament. This gave rise to many reproduction frames in highly simplified versions of classic Louis Louis French styles. And these can be disappointing when on paintings from a different era. It's a nice painting. 
this iconic 1845 Long Island painting, Eel Spearing at Setorquet by William Mount, somehow lost its frame, its first frame, and is now in a dull, machine-gilded frame that does nothing for the painting's geometric forms and perspective. I expect it will be reframed one day. This is the popular painting. It's, uh, it travels more than we do. Um, it will get replaced one day, uh, probably with a reproduction. After research of, of the form, and uh, paying the price, uh, a few thousand dollars. It's, uh, this is the same date as that, uh, the one with the swept sides that I showed of Rossiter, of a group of people in the center of the room. That's the same era, and that's something of the ilk of frame that it, this should have, certainly not machine gilding like this. Nowadays, commercially made uh, rail lengths have machine applied decoration with non-gold non -gold foil and toned coatings to slow tarnishing. And I have some examples here. But there are always custom frame makers that will never die. This painting by Barclay Hendricks has a strip frame. They have been popular since the 1950s with narrow wood nailed to the painting stretcher. The front edge might be gold gilded and in the 70s, plastic gold strips on the top were common. And this one is silver, silver plastic uh, strips around the around this edge, nailed onto the stretcher. Strip frames are different for, for paintings, as the stretcher now carries the whole weight in the hanging hardware. Um, I don't get concerned about value. Um, uh, I don't. Um, it's not my thing. The, this, is, this is valuable, though. Believe me, this is about five feet tall. It's a quite a powerful painting. I have it at work, flat on a table right now. Because uh, an issue is, is that the plastic shrinks. And uh, so now we've got misfitting plastic. The little pieces of wood are barely a quarter of an inch wide. And this has been on the wall, off the wall, on and off. And it's, now the wood is all damaged. And so what we're doing is, uh, and uh, this painting had, uh, like, like the beer stat behind me, it had draw marks. It wasn't keyed out. So by now that it has been keyed out uh, on its stretcher, the uh, strip frame fits even worse. And so we are actually replacing it. We're not going to, we're going to give the owner, um, which is like the state of New York or something, we're going to give them the old, they can have this uh, strip frame back again, but we're going to build a, um, a supporting frame behind this and then something that looks like a strip frame. So we're going to make a tray that this painting will drop into. But it has to be, uh, this actually has an hourglass shape to it. The width at the center is less than the top and bottom, as is common with the painting. And so the, this tray has to correspond to, to that size. So we're trying to get around it by making a reproduction that offers more support for the canvas. I, I don't know the value, but it's, it's up there. Uh, Asher B. Durand, um, 1845, original frame, in good condition now, uh, previously not in good condition. Um, every artist is associated with a certain frame style because of their time. Some choose their frames, some made them, and some didn't care very much.
Frederick Church, 1853, who later used Moorish designs. Uh, this one here has got sand dots, sand pattern, stenciled sand pattern. I say stenciled, it, it is stenciled. If you look at these sand patterns, um, they repeat after about nine inches or so. So they used a, a stenciled device to uh, repeat. Sanford Gifford, and you've got one over there. Um, 1861. And he is always in distinctive frames. All these artists are in distinctive frames. They are the they are pretty much the most fashionable artists, or the they've got um, um, and they 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 are choosing their frames. They are and um, Church Frederick Church. He was he was actively involved. He was probably drawing little Moorish designs, and his house has got them too. John Kensett, uh, which I can't remember if you've got, you've got frames like this here, but I can't remember if you've got a Kensett here. This is uh, 1865, equally so. You expect this kind of frame for him. Sergeant, uh, John Singer Sargent, so he, he has distinctive frames. And uh, he was, uh, many of his uh, portraits are f uh, fashionable uh, so social people of the time. And um, he, he is not choosing run-of-the-mill frames. He is choosing interesting frames that do participate with the painting. He also used antique frames. This is an antique frame. This frame is way older than the uh, canvas, which is uh, 1879. The frame is something is early 17th century French. And uh, hand carved and oak. Uh, oak was the French favorite oak for their carving. And this is, this is a lot of work. Um, it's much denser, it's much harder, but it carves well uh, when your chisels are sharp. And, but this was cut and pasted to fit the painting. It is so uh, original frames uh, can mean something like this. This could well be the original frame. We can't prove it because there are so many um, alterations to the frame. Um, it can't be proved, but this is very likely a, an original frame. So he, would, he was not afraid of using an antique frame. So artists would collect them. Stanford White, who I mentioned, who's the well-known architect, um, he collected frames, and he supplied frames and frame designs for uh, artists who he, who he knew. This is uh, Grant Wood. I don't have the... For I th actually, this painting, that, that painting there does not belong in this frame. I am trying the, that painting was missing a frame where it had a ridiculous frame and it was going on exhibition where they wanted it to look good. And so uh, we happened to have a, this grant, another grant wood in the building and I tried this frame on this painting. This is, grant wood is, we're in the lean years. And that, uh, it's true that in like civil war or various wars or major depressions, the frames get a little bit leaner. Um, that's understandable. And uh, Grant Wood was uh, not a lot of money. We're talking Depression era. We're in 1930s here and uh, in the Midwest. And so this is um, not a high style frame. It is totally effective, though. Excellent frame. It's a modernist frame. George Bellows. Uh, this one, I don't have a date, actually. He is uh, always in a distinctive frame. These two are different. Um, on the left is uh, gilded. It tends to have red colored, co red coloring, and it has a slightly undulating surface. It's not a, it's not machine-like flat. It undulates, and so 
for, for me, I love that. It participates. It creates um, an altering reflection as you walk past it. The one on the right is an original frame for this painting. It's a Newcomb Macklin, that Chicago uh, manufactory who, who made frames. But essentially, it is a, a, it's not too dissimilar, except one is gilded and one is toned gray. Edward Hopper. I, I imagine everybody here likes Edward Hopper. Uh, something sold. When uh, was, it, was it six months ago or eight months ago? Something of his sold for some bigger number than ever before. And so suddenly, then next week, this came in the building. This is big. Um, it's got to be about five feet high. Um, uh, to be fitted with glazing because uh, suddenly it's worth a whole lot more and so it needs to be uh, needs to be glazed because uh, it's um, that's the way it is always his paintings have distinctive frames and this is actually color coordinated it's a blotchy surface it's got whether it is gold or bronze powder I don't know well actually I think it, I don't think there's any gold here I think it is bronze bronze material, bronze powder, and various colors, including blues, that coordinate with the canvas. He is, uh, either he, he's got a very good line of communication with his framer. This frame is, I can't remember uh, the name of them, but it is New York City made. Um, very specific frame, can't be changed. Right. Uh, I use wood, actually. Um, the, the, you can get uh, strips of acrylic with a sticky surface on one side, but we've had an issue with those um, when they, uh, one of them once dropped down, and it's, so it's trapped, and then you get that sticky stuff up against the canvas, and that becomes a, not going to go there again. Um, so I use wood. I, I, I mentioned I'm a wood, wood, I've got table saws and that sort of thing. So maybe this one, oh, well, that hopper, it's got to be a minimum of, of a quarter inch, maybe because this one is quite large and the acrylic is made thicker because it's, it's not the eighth inch, we're up into the thicker stuff. But I use wood and then I can uh, paint them any color. I use wood. Use UV filtering acrylic or yeah. Optimum yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The expensive time. <laughs> uh, the uh, acrylic uh, plexi is an acrylic. Um, it doesn't block UV. It's very reflective. It's not scratch resistant. But then we get into the expensive acrylics. We block UV and uh, no static charge that's useful for pastels and uh, but the, the, there's a price uh, and, and non-reflective coating you wouldn't know um, you wouldn't know this is this is photographed with the acrylic in place uh, the, there is no reflection our photographer knows how to do it but um, it, it is expensive though it is becoming, and it's only been around for maybe 15 years, something like that. Previously, people were using laminated glass. That gets even more expensive, and it's extremely heavy. Uh, this is Charles, Charles Birchfield. He was, uh, this is actually a watercolor, but that doesn't matter. There's two different frames. There's one complete one, and then just the corner of another one. And uh, he was somewhere upstate New York, uh, like Buffalo, somewhere like that. And um, he made his own frames. They are color coordinated. I've looked at uh, lots of them, well, I don't know, a dozen or so. And um, they are color coordinated with his compositions. And uh, he does close framing, which is in watercolors. It means that the frame goes right up to the paper. There is no mat. 
Uh, he uses the, the white thing there is the mat, the liner, but he has coordinated the, the color of the molding. And on the, on the right there, we see what he was doing. There is right here, there's a little glint of gold. He was going to his local frame store, picking up a brass gilded molding, a picture frame stock with brass gilding on it and red paint underneath to look like bowl. And uh, he would join it up. He used a rasp or some such to create a corner ornament because we want corner ornaments are useful, as I explained. And then he painted it. So he, he started off where he needed molding. And he bought stuff with, uh, this is in the 1950s, 40s and 50s. So he, there's an example of somebody who is making their own frames. So here at the Athenaeum, the paintings were collected during the later 19th century, and for the most part, they were acquired new directly from the artist or their agent. There were no previous owners. The paintings came with their first frames, and here they have stayed. Like I say, it's, your number of originals is close, 95, 98, something like that, in terms of percentages. The collection at the Arnott Museum in Elmira, New York, was formed at the same time. But much of it was acquired from dissolving English estates and had already been reframed according to their taste. And there were older Dutch masterworks that had been reframed before they even got to England. So that's just a different collector's taste, but largely reframed. Older paintings with more previous owners are more likely to have been reframed. Um, Fraconard on the, on the left and Renoir on the right. Um, the Clark Collection, that's where I live, that's where my wife works and all that sort of thing. And, um, was largely acquired in the first half of the 20th century from dealers in London, Paris, and New York. The dealers then would happily change out a frame to improve the sale. And there was a busy industry resizing and regilding 18th century French frames for the new American market. The Clark has a few original frames, and I mentioned earlier, uh, of like 230 that are always up in the galleries, perhaps there are eight uh, originals. And so that puts it at, what is that, 2% or something like that. Very, very small, a uh, very small number compared to here. Several paintings actually lucked out with complementary old frames, and that's why I, I'm showing these two. Um, the Fragonard, I, I understand that painting was achieved in a, like a very quickly painted, uh, like it, in an hour. And uh, it has a fabulous frame with uh, all original gilding, uh, intricately worked. This is a uh, French 18, I imagine this is about 1840, the frame. and. Uh, no, 1740, and the painting is about 10 years after that. So stylistically, um, well, I think they work. Uh, it's got a lot of, the painting is very vivid, and the, uh, the frame is vivid too, with all, all of that. It's all carved wood, carved oak, and intricately worked gesso that has not been messed with by um, for any reason. It's a fa fabulous frame. The one on the right is, perhaps it's not a very good image, but it is um, very finely de detailed uh, gesso work. It's got punch work in the gesso, and that corresponds to the lace of her collar. 
small details like this. And so it, it works very well. They're totally unrelated to their paintings, but they, they work. But many, many of the frames there were resized and regilded, or frankly, they ended up in uh, cheesy reproduction frames. The Frick Collection in New York has important European paintings reframed for the sale by the influential London dealer Joseph Devine. Devine had many highly skilled European carvers and gilders making fabulous reproduction frames for wealthy American clients at the expense of the original frames. But at the, the advantage being that the, they were coordinated to the new owner's dwellings, like the Frick. Uh, Stephen Clark, that is actually Sterling Clark's brother, his collection is at the Fenimore Museum in Cooperstown, New York, and it's more aligned with the American folk art and has a mix of original and later frames. These don't belong to that collection, but they illustrate the American folk. So far, I've been describing the mainstream gilded frames, but simpler frames are just as interesting. Typically, they were more locally made for itinerant artists and were more likely to be painted or veneered. The joinery used at the, cor at the corners can also be distinctive, with lap joints, mortise and tenons, and dovetails, when most other corners are simply mitered and nailed. On the left is an Army Phillips in its original frame and a modern reproduction on a, on a Belknap panel painting on the right. So that's a, a reproduction, which is not very difficult to make, but the uh, original frame is very, is, is, is interesting. The Arkell Museum in Canajahari, New York, has many surviving original frames on late 19th and early 20th century American art. And, and ma many correspond to the arts and crafts aesthetic. The Williams College Museum has a large Prendergast collection with many carved and gilded frames made by Charles Prendergast. In 1903, Charles became a, a partner in the Boston frame shop Carrie Grohan, later become Thulin Murphy Company and then Vose Galleries. The, this is a pair of uh, Thulin frames carved wood, but we're, it's, everything cycles around. So uh, we are now in the early 20th century. We're back to wood carving as opposed to compo. Uh, these frames are signed. Uh, disregard the outer frame. I'll explain that. It's the gilded frame that is signed on the back. They would carve their, um, a mark and a model number in the back and a date, actually, which is always handy from my point of view. And they are now enclosed in outer frames, like a shadow box. It is walnut, but it's like a shadow box, modern materials. And uh, in order to, for these to be glazed, they have the expensive acrylic incorporated on them, because these are at Cornell. These people gave them the athletic building and these now hang at the entrance in the lobby of the athletic building, which incorporates uh, muscular people with equipment. And so uh, it's, it's not a museum environment, and there are other hazards. And so in order to try and do justice to all of this, uh, they got in encased, so to speak, with these uh, auxiliary frames around them. But it, it's, it's good for the frames, it keeps them clean, and it reduces the environmental factors. Uh, you know, on a wet day, it's gonna take longer for it to get humid inside the case. So there's acrylic across the front of the wall? Yeah. Yeah, each one has got acrylic. But it is the expensive stuff, and by expensive, um, uh, the thin, the 
thin one is, uh, which is eighth inch, uh, although they measure it in millimeters, but uh, it's 45 a square foot. And these are big, these are uh, about five feet tall. So it, it, it adds up pretty quickly. And then when you, these, uh, the, the larger the canvas, you want, want, you want your acrylic to be thicker. Uh, so you don't get any flex, and that just increases the cost. So that hopper was an expect that was, I don't know, a thousand or so for the acrylic, because it's a big painting. And the framing story only gets more complicated in a larger museum with multiple donors. This one's foreign, <laughs> you can tell. But there have been other influences of affecting the frames. Napoleon, which is why I showed this one, required many frames in the Louvre to be updated to his preferred empire style. This one is not from the Louvre, but it shows the empire style. And it is totally coordinated, just like the, that Renoir with the uh, young, young lady with the uh, lace collar, and it coordinated the, the frame, enhanced that collar, which is the cam, the painting. And here, the, uh, this is the original frame, the original gilding in the empire style, it's compo ornament, and um, his, his uh, whatever it is, embroidery, and his sort of um, decorative front there, uh, is enhanced by, by the ornament on that frame. And MoMA in New York City, in I think it was the, like the 1970s, they removed many turn of the century frames that were then considered to be too distracting. They wanted uniformity um, and they are kicking themselves or they're scurrying to try and find them again. And now actually a very good source for a sequence of frame styles because it takes you, one needs to learn the sequence of frame styles in order to date them, in order to consider what is an appropriate frame for a painting that has got a bad frame or has no frame. So we need to learn the sequence. And a very good sequence is uh, the recurring portraits in long standing institutions like state capitals and colleges. As the, and these all tell where the presidents get portraits every five years or whatever their their sequence is. So they get a, they add another portrait every five years, say. And so you get uh, and nobody borrows <laughs> institutional portraits because they're precious only to. A, a specific group of people. And so you get a very good sequence of uh, frame history in those. Uh, most st state capitals do have a, uh, um, uh, all, their, um, all their governors get, get their painting done um, today and for the last few hundred years. Well, whatever it is, 300. Ah, guess who painted this one? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you anyway. So this is this is Bouguereau, and this is a bad frame. So low-cost bronze powder was developed in the mid 1850s, and it was, its use on frames begins around 1900 with simulated gold effects called Roman gilding, shown here. This is a 1920s frame on an 1884 painting by Bouguereau. The frame lends some curvature to the subject, but it, it, it is out of sorts with the formal high style Barbizon gold frames that were used by the artist and his wife. And that's why I instantly say the Bouguereau out, in the, out there is in the wrong frame. Doesn't mean that you have to do anything about it, but it is, uh, as opposed to all these, are uh, in their right frames, 
uh, that one is not doing the doesn't is not having the effect. Um, it is uh, machine made, dull. Nineteen well, actually, it's probably a similar period to this one. Nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. It's nothing. So uh, uh, maybe the painting came here in. We don't know the story, um, but somehow it lost its frame, just like eel spearing lost its frame, and that happens. Perhaps it was damaged. Uh, perhaps it was too big. Um, don't know. Eventually, gold paint became available in cans and used for radiators, <laughs> and to freshen up dirty gilding on frames. The copper-based paint was bright at first, though not compared to the gold, and then it darkened to the color of old copper. Many frames were painted over, sometimes repeatedly, either over small damage, or the dirty bottom rail, or the whole frame. And all museums are familiar with this issue, including the Athenaeum. Conservatives continue to, to develop methods for its safe removal that does not affect the gilding below. It can be quick to remove using solvents in a ventilated space, or it is difficult. There is a dramatic effect when it is removed and the glow of gold is revealed. The, the dirt comes off as well in the process. And in a way, the bronze paint has actually been protecting the gilding. The bronze paint maybe was applied during the uh, 1920s, 30s, and 40s, maybe even in the 50s. Um, and so since then, the gold has been encased. And uh, to remove the paint, um, you uh, invariably, the gold is in very good condition. Old frames often have loose parts, and securing them is considered a priority to avoid their loss. They have missing parts too, and these can be handled in different ways according to their significance. They can be quickly impainted to blend in, or filled with copied parts that take more time. Dental impression materials are used to cast new parts of compo. And gesso losses are filled with spackle-like pastes. The fills can be colored with mica pigments or gilded with gold leaf. And it takes longer to copy the bright gold surfaces than the more dull surfaces. Uh, the bright so a damage on a liner, the flat, matte, watergill liner, if they're, from, imagine there was a two inch area of big damage, broken wood and all that. It is very demanding to recreate that surface because the um, gold is like a mirror. It is mirroring every imperfection that you introduce. If your fill is not perfectly level, it is, um, sticks out. They become very demanding, and hence the optivizer and that sort of thing. Harsh dusting and handling causes the gold to be abraded away, and the colored clay or white gesso to become visible. The moisture of hands or a wet cloth will also quickly remove water gilding. Old abrasions can be tolerated to a large extent, but measures are taken when they disturb the view of the painting. Is whole frame regilding an option? It can be done, but it will look restored, and reburnishing of aged surfaces is limited. Regilding creates an entirely bright surface that will need to be toned like a reproduction. And so the regilding of whole, whole frames is a, a last resort. Adding new layers of gesso and bowl for regilding is also problematic, as surface detail is lost, and the new layers tend to flake off eventually afterwards. Uh, glazing and uh, that's a big piece that's still got the in the middle. There is the um, optium; it's still got its protective 
fill my nap. Can't remember which one it is. Anyway, glazing is fitted to some paintings to, for increased protection. And today, the usual glazing is the optium, non-reflective, blocking UV and non-static. Non Spaces are fitted uh, with, uh, between the glazing and the uh, painting. And a wood build-up, shown here, can be added to the frame back to improve the housing. Because once you add glazing, you're, you're pushing the painting further back, it's sticking out more, and Usually, glazing is, is added for in, where, where in my workplace. Usually, glazing is uh, required when things are going to travel. It's part of uh, insurance or it's part of policy. When something travels, it gets glazed if it's of a certain fragility. And then if you're going to travel it, that means you're going to be putting it in a crate or some sort of uh, enclosure, you don't really want the painting sticking out the back. So we add a build-up on the back. Here, this one is sugar pine. It is being just about to be screwed to the back of the frame. An advantage of uh, adding a build-up is that it now bears the repetition of new screw holes for securing the painting and hanging hardware, leaving the original evidence on the frame more intact. I happen to know this frame, though, is uh, one of those cut and pasted French examples. It's been cut down to its present size, and uh, they added this section here is uh, the supporting wood, because since they had destroyed the structure of the frame, they added that build-up, which is chestnut. And ch chestnut is 1920 to 1960 uh, American. So presumably, this was done in New York in, in something like 1960, something like that, by dealers who, who were s selling the painting to whatever museum this was. Um, And so th this is not historic evidence that it's, a, it's already a compromised frame. Whereas you look at the backs of many of these, it is, uh, there, um, there are very few holes in one of screws for and nails used to uh, hang them or secure everything together. And these, these, all, these, all this amounts to evidence that proves that they are original. Or, but here, it is highly compromised already, so the, the screw holes are not really an issue. And a build-up can also be used to support failing corner joinery. So if it is all, all a floppy thing and falling apart, a, uh, an easy way of fixing this is to add, uh, make, make a build-up to the right size and then um, screw it on the back. Uh, more sensitive paintings for traveling, for exhibitions, can be enclosed in sealed microclimate boxes to eliminate the variations in humidity that cause dimensional change. This is uh, Gauguin, uh, Christian girl, something. The painting is placed in a sealed tray that's uh, visible on the left. The painting is in that tray. The, the tray is made up out of aluminum angle, in this instance here. It's made up out of aluminum angle, silicone adhesive to fix a dye bond back. A dye bond is aluminum with polyethylene in between. It's a flat panel, uh, lightweight flat panel, low, relatively low cost. So we've created a tray. We can uh, condition the interior. We can put some material in there to absorb pollutants, because there's always pollutants. Um, put the painting in. The, the, the tray is sized exactly to fit the painting. And then uh, put the painting in, put the glazing over the top, and seal it down with uh, seals, uh, aluminum tape with acrylic adhesive. And uh, then it will go back into the frame, 
and from the front, you can't see it. Uh, so it is, you could take this into a sauna, let's say, or your bathroom, and uh, it would experience no change in humidity whatsoever. And that is done for uh, panel paintings uh, when they travel, uh, most often. But here, this is on canvas, it's fragile, and uh, I can't, oh, it's going to Canada, which isn't that far away, well, particularly from here. <laughs> um, When art travels for exhibitions, it is very well cared for, with inspections and gloves at every stage. And any small change results in a string of emails. But people are, are examining, um, they are looking at it very closely, writing any, making notes, and that accompanies the painting at every stage of, and then it gets inspected again. I just want to ask you about the line on there. Is that reflection? It is, it is, but that's just me. Um, these things, uh, the, the, that, this is the expensive acrylic, and it is a reflection, but I was just in the studio, that's with my cell phone, um, and, but the reflection, the anti-reflective property of this material is designed so that the light is coming down at an angle. You are basically five feet, your eyes are five feet, so uh, there is a, a certain geometry happening. And here, I, um, it's just my cell phone and whatever. You yep. can tell the reflection has sort of a green gas to it. That's yes. the yep. 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 Oh, yep, well, it's, it happens with everything. You, you know, these, these, you could, with one of these, you could probably buy the building. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't mean that, uh, but these, these become hugely valuable, and so, so the Jackson Pollock on the left uh, is a four, foot, four, four feet wide piece of floppy masonite. It had no frame. So it had uh, uh, torn corners, and uh, you, know how mas you can imagine how masonite, once you bump it around uh, the edges, it start starts to crumble. And, um, and so this uh, fr float frame was added for support and to enable hanging. How do you hang it? You can't put an eyelet in the back of a eighth inch masonite that belongs to Jackson Pollock, because uh, it will come through the front, but, but also it would um, fall out, because masonite doesn't really take eyelets very well. So you, you can't really hang it, and so you've got all these, you can't, it's difficult to handle, it's floppy, and so we've got all these issues. So it has now been given a supporting structure and what looks like a strip frame. It floats it, it all the edges are visible. Uh, as opposed to all these, all these paintings, the edges are hidden behind a rebate or rabbit. There you are. And then uh, that's his wife on the on the right there, Lee, Lee Krasner. That painting uh, is about 20 inches high. Uh, in its early aluminum frame, and. Uh, Glazing and a, a painted enclosure, painted a sort of a dark gray, was added because this painting, uh, the pigments are totally underbound. So it's not my determination, but a painting person has examined this, optivizer, has examined this closely, and you can't clean it. You can't touch the paint because it is so crumbly. It's... Um, 
So now, uh, since it can't be cleaned, we had to devise a, uh, we, there's, you go through a design phase and you get approvals and you work out the colors and all that sort of thing and uh, come, try and come up with a solution. So no holes were made in this painting because there were a couple of, in the back of the aluminum frame, there were a couple of vacant holes that were uh, utilized to secure this into another dye bond back, this uh, eighth inch thick uh, piece of aluminum and polyethylene, and, uh, and put into a painted wood frame with glazing. So now it won't get dirty, and now it can, this is on its way to London for an exhibition. These things get borrowed, and so they, people still want to borrow them, but you have to uh, this is part of what goes into the museum exhibition industry. Ophelia, this is about 1887, 1890. Uh, I'll show a couple of reproduction frames. This one is based on a 1890 newspaper clipping. For years, the painting was hung with just the flimsy liner that is still, that was reused. So the painting was suffering because it didn't have the support. The painting was getting all sort of twisted. It's a stretched canvas with a skimpy liner on it. And uh, it was getting all distorted because it had no uh, structural frame. So uh, it was the, in the interests of uh, the health of the painting, a reproduction was made. So a reproduction based on, there was this, this is the evidence, that newspaper clipping was the evidence that suggested the style, although 1890s, uh, that's, that is basically the style at that time. So one is usually uh, trying to, uh, one needs to have a reason for uh, a design. And I don't know what, I can't remember what that cost. It's quite tall, that's quite a big painting, um, perhaps about this tall. Um, what did that cost? I don't know, maybe 8,000 or something like that. It adds up. And it, uh, to, uh, it looks like a reproduction frame to, to a framing person. It, it's, it's not convincing, but it, it, it is a safe housing. It looks good from a distance, but on close inspection, it is a reproduction frame. That was a museum uh, in Springfield, Mass. This one here is uh, a museum in Albany, New York. And uh, this is Rococo Revival. And that's what, uh, all the way through the 19th century, not, in the, not so much in the 40s, but after that we get all these con constant revival of styles. If there's a taste for the Gothic, there's a taste for the Rococo, there's a taste for all these different styles. It's constantly shifting, and that's why you can date these things to specific periods. The main outer section of this Rococo revival frame from 1849 was missing. That's on the left. So it was just living in this uh, spandrelled mat. And a modern reproduction was fitted. It takes some research to determine the right period style and then some dollars to pay for it. And I'll, I'll show some uh, mismatched but interesting examples. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> this is 1840, painting by Joseph Turner. And believe it or not, Turner favored ordinary, quite dull, conservative English frames. And this one here 
is kind of fun in a, a very elaborately carved wood frame, highly gilded. I, it's kind of fun. Um, but if you go to the Tate, for example, where there's a lot of turners, uh, you will see uh, if they, they, there might be a few reproductions or a few reframed turners there, but they have established the chronology of his framing styles. And so this is completely wrong, but it is fun. Uh, I th it, it, it's a kind of spacey painting, and all that movement in the frame is kind of spacey too. It is, uh, it is very well made frame, but um, it is mismatched. Where is that? That's at the Clark in Williamstown. Yeah. What is the title of the painting? Uh, rockets, rockets and skylights, or something like that. Rockets and lights. Um, I think there might be a vessel in distress. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hence a flare, perhaps. Uh, these, these handsome frames are from the 1830s, and the paintings are earlier. The one on the uh, right is actually a European painting. So, and then it, and it, uh, the frame is 1830, uh, just compo, look, corners and centers is where the compo is. It hasn't spread along the rails. Uh, it's 1830. And uh, it might be, this has been in the same family ever since it came to the, this country. Uh, the, the painting came to this country, so it's probably, Frame. Maybe they brought the painting rolled up, and then it got re it got framed in this country, and they used the style at the time, which was 1830, and hence it's in that in that frame. And then. Uh, this is your uh, Dutch master. This is uh, Ferdinand Boll. 17th century uh, Dutch portrait is housed in an 18th century French frame that was cut down and just like the, the one where I was showing the build up that has been added on the back, this frame has been, um, has got cut seams through in symmetrical places. Um, that's what I look, look for uh, from the front of the frame, but they are usually more apparent when you look at the edges or inside the rebate. So it's entirely uh, uh, wrong, but it's a, it's a handsome combination and people are quite happy with it. Here's a, another sar sergeant. Um, this one here is called Fume d'Ambergris. She is inhaling the fumes from that uh, lamp, lamp, some device down on the floor there. Um, this is in a, uh, an ordinary uh, 20th century frame. It's not unpleasant, um, but it's ordinary. And I have tried to suggest earlier that uh, Sargent really didn't do ordinary frames. He did pretty good frames uh, or interesting or uh, they were either antique because they were and they matched very well. They did something for the canvas or they were um, newest styles kind of. And that's there is in the Metropolitan where uh, I think is um, mother or something gave all his papers to the Metropolitan, and in, in, in there is this uh, early photograph of the original frame. However, this photograph is cropped. Uh, we don't see the outer part of the molding. All we see is the wide liner with corner and center ornaments plus little half center ornaments as well. So if one goes to um, If one wants to, uh, one could re recreate that frame, and that this is the sort of ideal evidence. And then one would, because the canvas is quite light, one, one would want to know, uh, one can see here, one can see the, 
leaf size, the size of the metal leaf. And so there is, this is a black and white image. Uh, and uh, was it gold or was it silver? It has been asked. And one could actually uh, get, a, get measurements of this and compare it to measurements within the carpet and then we've got the uh, we've got the painting and we can we can because silver leaf is a little bit bigger than gold and so we can we can determine uh, whether it is silver or gold it's probably gold because silver tarnishes Well, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, answer that by also referring you to uh, there is a, this is very easy, you don't have to write it down even. Uh, there is a, a um, I was mentioning it to Bob earlier, Lynn, Lynn Roberts is a frame historian in Britain and um, she's written, uh, she's participated in most of the English uh, frame history books, of which there are more than there are here. Uh, and she writes something called the frame blog. And so if you look up the frame blog, and then uh, you click yes somewhere, I don't know where, <laughs> and then you will get it, you will receive it, and then you decide whether you want to read it or not. You won't get, you won't get inundated because these things take, take so a lot of time. She doesn't write them all, but, uh, and her thing is not really American frames, it's more European, but th this is, she was discussing recently um, that, that sort of thing and where you get trophy frames. Now, he, he, now you've got symbolism. So you've got some sort of military thing, a subject of military, and then you get trophy uh, uh, ornament were built, made up out of cannons and cannonballs and flags and that sort of thing. So that's, that, there's an example. Most of these, these generally, because we've got two types here, we've got European and American, but generally, this, these, these American ones here are, because of the era, we're into, they're all sort of classical. They're fluted coves, uh, laurel and berry, um, acanthus. These are all sort of classical things. And they're not really, they're just, they are just sort of like bits of plastic. That it's the shape that they're after. It's not really the name of the plant. In the uh, 40s, we 1840s, where you've got this, uh, the glory of the, the this country's nature and the wildlife and that sort of thing, flora. Then um, we do get more. There is more chance of seeing things copied from nature, uh, like I, I mentioned the noded stick. But that's a little bit before this time here. Uh, ivy, entwined ivy. Um, morning glories and that sort of thing. They are recognizable um, plant forms. But rarely is it, in this category, it's not symbolic. I think it is simply, or the only, it's just classical stuff. It's sort of neo-neoclassical. But it does occur um, with uh, trophy frames and with, and with others where uh, the ornament is she wrote, Lynn Roberts is her name. She's great. She's got a sense of humor, too, so it's, it's nice. It's called The Frame Blog. The Frame Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it always has images. And um, she, has, she was discussing this um, about two months ago. 
um, yeah, there's not really that much symbolism it, it, at this in here, but it does it does happen. Uh, can one recognize the plant forms? Well, it, it, it is just, these are just classical. It's often beads because they, they create a sort of a dental pattern or sort of on-off, a binary pattern of pips. Uh, but it's strung beads. Uh, it doesn't mean anything more than that. Um, acanthus is just a classical uh, plant that has been developed by, uh, stylized by wood carvers and then uh, compo makers endlessly. Uh, this has got acanthus in the corners. So there, is, there, uh, there isn't, but there is on, in other frames. Uh, there is the example of uh, the uh, ornament has been made. Uh, ornament has been made out of everything, but it has been made out of some frames. You will find corn, for example, ears of corn, which is an, that's an American thing. Ears of corn. And so I've, I've tried to uh, show some of the, uh, the the story of frames that they uh, they go way beyond before this period here, and they continue with uh, modern modern art. More modern art has got these other sort of physical issues of it can't be cleaned or it needs to be hung. And um, but I'd like to and you might think that you. You've got frame problems, but I'd like to just show you one frame problem that is kind of the biggest. <laughs> uh, so in the, on the right there, that's a reproduction frame. And in the middle there is uh, the original frame, but it's been, uh, um, it, all, it's, all the good outside bits have been cut off. And there, there's a detail on the left there of what her frame looks like uh, with it cut off. You can see that the ornament is not continuous. Now, this, 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 is, this is, I can multiply this by five because these, there's five, I think it's five of these portraits. The family is Cadwallader. There is um, lots of money in Philadelphia, I think. The, the artist is. Peel. The date is 1876, 77, around there, 78. So it's, that's American. And uh, the carvers are known, or the, the original carver is known. Uh, they were sort of shortly off the boat, so to speak. So it is the new American. These were these were. Uh, whole series of family portraits. Then in 19, 1919, a, a, the descendant who owned them at that time, and these are carved wood. So if you've got a carved wood frame, you can't take a micrometer or a, 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 a ruler and compare the size of one corner to the other. It's going to vary by eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch because it's only made to uh, uh, satisfy the eye. It's the carving that is, and you don't notice it when it is up on the wall, but it, the things vary. As opposed to the compo ornament, it's more machine-like. It is more consistently uh, repetitive. And uh, in 1919, the uh, owner was getting fed up because there were, it, it, it is pierced. It, you can see in that reproduction, which is not a perfect reproduction. Um, you can see it's pierced. It has holes through the wood carving. And uh, there were, that means that whenever you put this down or knock into it, bang into it, you lose bits. It breaks off. And so he got so fed up with all these, and they, uh, he trimmed them all down. He trimmed all that fancy stuff off the outside edges. Now there's, and then they all got regilded as well. So these are, these are important, very important, I'd say, uh, American frames, wood carved, 17, uh, in the last, last few years of the 1770s, big family, Cadwallader, um, 
These are owned by the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And uh, the problem is how to restore those frames. And that's, there's, a, there's a framing problem. It's, that's, dif that's difficult because uh, you can't, you can't uh, you can take the overgilding off and expose the original gilding. You'd have to do that to find all the spring points of where the wood uh, was cut and severed. So that then you would have to uh, incorporate new wood. But you've got to come up with the design. And this is a quickly, the reproduction here was quickly realized. But the task really facing the museum now is to do it for real and make it, make it, um, convincing. Very difficult, because these are unique. And they are, they, I, I, I consider them to be uh, well, early American. So I, that's, that's it, really. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. We don't have any problems that bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're, 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 you're OK. You're OK here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, but this is this is a special uh, collection. It is uh, I've looked at lots of these these things in lots of different places, and as I say, the the number of survivors here is extremely high, and this information I I think this. Warrants uh, publication, and uh, so that uh, other people can appreciate it. Um, I wouldn't want you to have too many people coming in here, though. Yeah. Thank you.